the ZV-E1 is out and available to the public. I got a delivery notification yesterday that mine had arrived and for the last day and a half I've been going over this thing to learn all about it. When you first receive your new camera, I think the first thing you're going to notice is the very simple packaging it comes in. According to Sony, they're making a push to be more sustainable with the materials they're packaging things in. So this is all recycled cardboard and all the bags in here are made out of bamboo fibers instead of plastic. Good green stuff, Sony. You get a camera body, a strap to hold your camera, a little dead cat for the microphone, and a battery. The ZV lineup from Sony are meant to be vlogging cameras. They say this has a more intuitive interface, although if you come from the Alpha lineup, you may not immediately find everything to be intuitive, as this camera comes with four less buttons, three less dials, one less memory card slot, and minus one joystick. But I imagine this thing's not meant for pros who are buying yet another Sony camera body. It's built to be for those who are coming from a smartphone who want an insane bump in picture quality, low light performance, lens choices, and all that. As for button layout, the ZV-E1 is almost identical to the ZV-E10, its APS-C little brother. The ZV-E1 got this one extra button on the back and a new three-way switch that replaced the mode button on the top. Otherwise, the design is the same. It is bigger though. This camera is slightly smaller than a naked A7S III without a viewfinder, but it's a bit thicker than the ZV-E10. As far as the weight though, it feels more like a ZV-E10 than an A7S III. It's way lighter than this. This camera is 399 grams and this one is 659 grams. That is 40% lighter. A guy could say basically half the weight of an alpha camera. So if lightness is a category you're looking for, this bad boy is super light. The Sony a7S III and the Sony a7 IV are both made of a magnesium alloy, which is this special super strong, but also super lightweight, which spoiler alert, can conduct heat really well, which keeps the processor cool. Where the ZV-E1 is made out of Sorplast, Sor Sony's proprietary plastic that's made from recycled bottles and old optical discs. Remember those? Remember CDs? Evidently, this plastic is super durable, temperature resistant, fire retardant, and 99% recyclable again and again forever. So it's a plastic camera, which is how it's even lighter than the magnesium alloy bodies. There is a metal plate on the bottom where everything attaches, so it's not like you're gonna strip the thing out by eventually rigging it up with a cage and everything else like we tend to do. We've got USB-C for power delivery and data transfer. It's got separate microphone in and headphone out jacks, and my least favorite port, the micro HDMI. Every bit as functional as a full-size HDMI, just micro. So that's what this camera is, let's talk about what this camera does. The ZV-E1 is a 12 megapixel, 4K video shooting, larger than normal, smart microphone having, AI featured little monster. In practical terms, the output that you're gonna get from this thing, this camera is an A7S III, Sony's flagship video centric camera, but without a viewfinder, a lot less buttons and dials, and a bunch of smart features added in via this AI chip from Sony. This camera has five axis in-body image stabilization, the most impressive person, animal, insect, automobile, airplane train object tracking I've ever seen, even better than the a7S III, and its software is designed so that you don't necessarily have to be a camera pro to get pro footage. What I mean by that is you don't need to know what aperture to shoot at and then what ISO and shutter speed to use to compensate for in order to blur out the background. There's literally a button that's just labeled background defocus. There's even a setting on here called cinematic vlog, where it puts black bars on the top and bottom of the screen to simulate a 20 by nine aspect ratio and changes the picture profile to look some kind of way. Beyond those things, there's also this automated framing feature. So it'll shoot a 4K picture, but intelligently crop in so that if you move around in the frame, the camera will follow you around the frame. It's obviously cropping way in in order to do this, so the resolution pretty much has to go down, but I do know it's using clear image zoom to accomplish it, and that's some kind of black magic f***ery so that the picture actually looks pretty good. Sony came out with a new creators app that you can use to start and stop the camera, and also to turn on tracking and framing so you can choose your subject. While doing the auto framing, you can pick between three levels of tightness and also the speed at which it will follow you around. One thing to note is that since it's only moving around a virtual framed box inside a larger picture, the motion blur will look odd if you have a normal shutter speed. Normally when the camera's tracking you, the camera moves to keep you in frame, which means that from the camera's perspective, it's the background that has motion, not the person. But since this is in reality a static camera, you are the thing that's moving, so the movements, your body becomes blurry with the clear background that moves behind you. I actually just think it's kind of a thing the world will get used to seeing because this feature is cool enough that people are probably gonna use it. It gets even more advanced with two people. The camera can sense when there are two of you in the frame and if you're not sitting in the same plane of focus, it'll crank down the aperture and then compensate the ISO so that you're both in focus. You can even pick a primary person so that if one person goes a little too far out of the screen, it'll stay on one of you and not the other one. On to the autofocus tracking enhancements. The real-time focus tracking has dramatic 
dramatically improved with this camera. And I want to say, I never saw anything wrong with the a7S III. This camera already blows me away with how well it can stick on someone's eyeball and keep them in focus no matter how you're moving. But I set up a test here in the warehouse where I have a pretty busy background with cages and flight cases and a tool chest and pretty flat colors all around with no lights specifically on me. And I ran around and danced around and jumped up and down and the ZV-E1 would not let go of focus on me. You can see how it's doing it too. If it loses track of my eyes, it'll use my head. And if my head is moving too much, presumably making more motion blur that it can resolve, it switches to using my body. That's what this long rectangle tracking box is. Sony put a new AI chip in this camera that can recognize not only faces of things, but also recognize the general way a human body moves. So it picks up on the fact that this is a person and it uses that to track. For instance, if I turn around, you can see it doesn't lose the focus lock. It still knows that's me. I can cover my eyes and it'll keep focusing on my face, something the a7S III just won't do. Here we're switching to the a7S III for the same test, which does not have this separate AI chip. Still really sticky eyeball autofocus, and when it loses my eyes, it does track my head, but those are really its only two tricks. You'll see if I turn around, it doesn't continue to track my body or the back of my head, and if I cover up my eyes from the side, it sort of just gives up and waits. Also, it's a little more sensitive to fast movement. The focus lock lets go for a few frames here and there if I jump up and down or move super quickly. Generally, it's still incredible in the grand scheme of autofocus, but they've made autofocus even better in this new camera for sure. That AI chip is here to stay, I'm guessing. Concerning the 4K 120p setting, when all the bigger YouTuber people had their hands on this camera early, they would mention how 4K 120 wasn't available yet, so they couldn't test it out. Well, that's still the case. It's still not available now in May of 2023, but the Sony website says an upgraded license key will be available in June of 2023 with that feature built into it. So for now, you're limited to 60 frames per second to showcase your amazing hammer juggling. The super duper slow-mo was definitely a selling point for me, so I guess make sure you're subscribed to the channel for that sweet, sweet content coming in June. Next, dynamic active steady shot. With this camera, Sony has given us three levels of steady shot. Standard steady shot, which just uses IBIS combined with whatever lens stabilization you have at the time. With standard steady shot in 4K, you have the entire sensor readout, there's no crop. Next is active steady shot, which is a built-in software stabilization combined with the IBIS that crops in a little bit and makes your shot even more steady. And now dynamic active steady shot. This is using the clear image zoom plus the new auto framing AI thing to crop in even further and keep your chosen subject in the center of the frame or wherever you want them in the frame. If you don't choose a subject, the camera will try to decide what it thinks is your subject. Dynamic steady shot is really smooth, like close to gimbal smooth, as long as you continue on the same physical path you started on when you started recording. I'm cycling through a bunch of clips of me following my wife through Epcot at Disney yesterday. You'll see it's just crazy smooth unless I move the camera just a little more than it has chosen as its cropped amount. And when I slip outside that parameter, it sort of jumps to the new framing and that's kind of ugly. This happens real bad if you start to pan after having gone straight for a little while because the AI gets confused and is trying to keep the path straight but runs out of picture on the side of the frame. So you have to use this carefully, but when used in a way that works well, it works freakishly well. There is a significant crop. I'll just cycle the camera through the modes here and you can see how big the crop is. You can actually switch between standard and active while you're filming. So that's, this is active and then I'll switch to dynamic active. So that's quite a bit more zoomed in with the dynamic active. Also, just a general tip, any software stabilization will always look better with a faster shutter speed. Motion blur really screws up software stabilization. So these dynamic active daytime shots following Sarah should look a bit better than these nighttime shots following Sarah. And like I said before, with a crop in, there kind of has to be a drop in quality. And since we're starting at 4K, it can only go down from there. Although clear image zoom does some sort of futuristic upscaling that looks really close to 4K. I don't know. AI. Speaking of clear image zoom, this camera has a little rocker switch on the shutter button. If you have one of Sony's motorized zoom lenses, this will control that. But even if you have a prime lens on the camera, this switch activates clear image zoom and you get an extra little like 20% of zoom in with any lens and somehow still makes a 4K picture through, like I said, some kind of black magic fuckery. The overheating issue. Unfortunately, the overheating issue is real. I thought maybe that would be a pre-production thing and when the camera actually came out, they would find some way to solve it. But this camera is super compact. It's made out of plastic. It doesn't have a fan and plastic is more of an insulator than it is a conductor, which means it traps heat. 37 minutes into my recording, the temperature warning showed up on screen and at 40 minutes it had shut off. Now I'm in a pretty hot warehouse. I'm in Orlando, Florida. It's 81 degrees in here. That's 27.2 degrees for you Brits and Canadians and everybody else. 
literally everybody else. There's practically no moving air in here at the moment, so it, this overheated a little faster than it would in like an air conditioned studio environment. And in fact, I did do a separate test where I had a little fan blowing on the camera and it could record to infinity or until I gave up. So if you're in a very controlled environment, this is not an issue. But if you're someone who records outdoor summer concerts and the camera's gonna be running for like a really long time, in the heat, this may not be the camera for you. At least maybe not without some modifications. I have a suspicion that one of these little stick-on copper heat sinks will solve the problem. And I'm gonna try that out and make that video next. My takeaways, who is this camera for? As advertised, I think this is an ideal camera for a vlogger. Someone who's coming from a cell phone, wants a huge bump in quality, and someone who's becoming really serious about their work. Cause even though this camera is way cheaper than the a7S III, it's still over $2,000. It's far from cheap. But if you're making vacation stuff or travel stuff or vloggy stuff where you're doing short snippets, the camera's on and off all the time, it's never gonna overheat. And if that's the case, this is basically an a7S III, which was the best video camera ever made, in my opinion, in my very humble opinion. Also, if you're looking for a studio camera that can produce every bit as high a quality of a final product as the a7S III or what I'm recording on the a7 IV, this is that too. This is, it's the exact same sensor and processor as the a7S III. So the picture that comes out of this will look just like that. And there's a bonus if you're like a DIY person who's doing stuff and you have to move around in your scene, the camera can follow you. That's really nice. The auto framing feature can actually be really cool and really useful. If you're a hybrid shooter though, and you want to take a lot of photographs, spend your 2000 something bucks on an a7 IV or an a7R5. Shooting pictures without a viewfinder is weird and hard, but maybe that's just me being the old man in 2007 who refuses to switch from film to DSLR.